Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. I've often heard people suggesting that the Apollo moon landings must be faked because the photos taken on the moon look too perfect or too professional and that the cameras had no viewfinders. So how did astronauts manage to take such good photos whilst wearing big spacesuits, thick gloves, a large helmet, all with a camera that they couldn't aim properly? So today I'm going to try and address this. Firstly, let's address this idea that the photos look too good. Now, this could be construed in one of two ways. Either they're talking about the clarity of the photographs is too good, or the composition is very professional looking. Now, in terms of clarity, this actually has very little to do with the person operating the camera and more to do with the camera itself. For example, I can take the same photos with my main camera and my phone, and at small sizes, it could be difficult to see the differences between them. But when zoomed in, the differences become night and day. In par, this comes down to the largest sensor, but the main factor is the quality of the optics. Most professional grade camera lenses cost more than an entire phone, and the camera on a phone is only actually a fraction of that cost. Not only were the Apollo moon cameras Hasselblad medium format cameras using 70 millimeter film, which has about four times the surface area of these full frame sensors, but they used Zeiss lenses, which are often regarded as some of the best lenses on the market in terms of optical quality. Now, the main lens that was used on the moon was a 60 millimeter F5.6 Zeiss lens, which was custom made by Zeiss specifically for that specialized camera that they used during the moonwalks. But the Apollo missions also took other regular Zeiss lenses with them, such as a 80mm f2.8 and a 250mm f5.6. And here is a Hasselblad product brochure from December 1965, showing those lenses back in 1965 costing $286 and $450 respectively, which accounting for inflation is about $2,900 and $4,500 today. Get a modern medium format camera and a high-end lens with the right settings already dialed into it, and even Rusty here could take photos that have great clarity to them. But now, what about this idea that the composition of the photos looks too good for non-professional photographers? Well, in total, from all of the Apollo flights, there were more than 20,000 photos taken. Of the missions that landed on the moon, there were more than 5,500 photos taken outside on the lunar surface, which I've been extensively looking through to see just how good the compositions really are. Plus, each mission had months of preparation, which included extensive training involving the astronauts practicing to take photos with the camera in a similar setup that they would then use on the moon. So they weren't really novices because they'd had many hours of practice. You can get a pretty good grasp of most things with hours of practice. I mean, just take today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, for example. For me, this is one of the most easy and effective ways to learn. Each course starts with the basics of a topic and gradually builds up with practice, even whilst you're on the go, and you can build up an understanding of each topic over time, which is what I've been doing. I've used Brilliant now for more than 800 consecutive days, and in that time, I've completed more than 1,000 classes. And the classes aren't mind-numbingly long. You can do them in just 5 to 10 minutes each day. Plus, the classes are made quite engaging through their use of interactive animations. Try it for yourself by taking a 30-day free trial using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and doing so will also earn you 20% off their annual subscription. So, let's first look through some of the Apollo photos. Obviously, one of the best-known ones is this a photo of Buzz Aldrin taken by Neil Armstrong during the EVA of Apollo 11. 
Now, if we're being critical on the sort of level that a professional photographer would be, this photo is not actually that great. If we zoom in on a large resolution scan of it, you can see that Buzz is slightly out of focus, but the lunar module foot in front of him is in focus. So the focus for this photo is actually slightly off and the composition is actually skewed. The camera is slightly twisted to the right, which is why the horizon appears tilted, which is actually a pet hate of many professional photographers. And the very top of Buzz is actually cut off. Ideally, the camera would have been tilted slightly higher. So from a purely technical standpoint, it's not actually that great of a photo, but it is certainly iconic. But that's only one photo. Let's look through the rest of the photos that were taken during Apollo 11. There were a total of 120 photos shot on the surface during the two and a half hour EVA. Starting with a shot of one of the lunar module legs, this was actually taken a few minutes after Armstrong set foot on the moon. Interestingly, he didn't have the camera with him when he came down the ladder. Because the camera is attached to the astronaut's chest, it was going to get in their way as they came down the ladder. Instead, the camera stayed up in the lunar module and he went down the ladder with a rope attached that ran up to the lunar module. Once he was on the surface, Aldrin attached the camera to the rope and Armstrong was able to roll the rope around like a conveyor belt to bring the camera down to him. Okay, boys, we ready to uh, bring down the camera? I'm all ready, I think it's... Uh... And this is something you can even see them practicing doing during training prior to the mission. Once he got the camera, he then stepped off to the side and he took the first photos on the moon, which was a sequence of nine photos turning slightly to the right in between each shot to create a panorama that ran from one side of the lunar module right the way across the landscape and round to the other side. He then took three more photos of the right side of the lunar module where the panorama started from, by which point Buzz was beginning to come out of the lunar module. So we then have a photo or two of Buzz in the hatchway, then two more photos taken of the base of the lunar module, one of which was the engine bell and the other one showing the right side leg. Then there's a sequence of four photos of Buzz coming down the ladder, a photo of the lunar module's left leg, then a random photo that I think is looking behind the front leg, a few of Buzz setting up a solar wind sail and posing for a photo with the flag, a few of the ground as Armstrong shows himself leaving a footprint, another 12 photo panorama sequence in front of the lunar module, five photos shooting random parts of the lunar module, four photos of the plaque that they left attached behind the lunar module ladder, a random crooked photo of the ground, then two of Buzz standing next to the lunar module, what then must be a mistaken shot of an out of focus spacesuit, then another 12 photo panorama from way off to the side of the lunar module, then 10 more photos showing various details of the lunar module, such as the feet, the legs, and the back of the ascent stage. After which, Armstrong steps away from the lunar module around to the back right side, taking some more photos of the lunar module and then panning the camera around. Then 11 photos of Buzz walking away with some of the experiments and setting them up. After which, Armstrong relocates to the edge of the crater way off behind the lunar module, taking another panorama of photos, followed by two more shots of Buzz setting up equipment and rounding off with the last few detailed shots of the lunar module and the lunar surface. So, looking through all of those, the compositions are not particularly anything special. Most of the photos are either shots of panoramas, where Armstrong was just turning on the spot in between each photo, or they're random photos of various parts of the lunar module, or they're showing what Buzz was doing. And this all makes sense when you consider that they weren't taking photos like a professional shoot. The point was to just document everything for the engineers and the scientists back home. I'm gonna get in a position at this point to photograph 
him coming down the ladder. Okay, and while he's preparing to come down, I'm going to take a couple pictures of Lem, the deep in engine, the foot pad. Next task that I'd have is to move over into the uh, squad one region, make a uh, initial inspection of the Lem area. A series of photographs that are taken. Move one up of the uh, ascent stage. I'd be looking at the uh, thruster quadrant, evaluating any effect of thruster impingement from quad one into the descent stage. He took several panoramas so that people could get a good idea of the lunar landscape, a far better idea than any of the TV pictures would allow them to see. He took many detailed shots of the various parts of the lunar module for the Grumman engineers to assess. Given that the lunar module was not returning to Earth, they couldn't personally inspect it to see how things like the Mylar insulation held up with landing. So they needed detailed photos to know if there were any areas for improvement for future missions. Kind of like how all of the cameras that they fit to Starship launches are not primarily there for our viewers' entertainment, they're placed in strategic locations for SpaceX engineers to be able to see what's going on with the ship. Since they won't get the ship back to be able to inspect it, they need the footage to be able to work out what was going on. Even the photo that Armstrong took of his boot print, you might initially consider that to be quite artistic. But this before and after would allow people back on Earth to get a clearer idea of the texture of the lunar regolith. So, all in all, whilst the photos look very good in terms of clarity, the actual compositions are not anything special. And it's really much the same story if you look through all the other missions. For all the other missions, they had two photo cameras with them, so one for each astronaut, and they also spent increasing amounts of time on the surface, which combined allowed them to take far more photos in each mission. But looking through these, you still find the same things. Lots of photos of the lunar module during the early landings, lots of panoramas documenting the various locations where they were, photos detailing the equipment setups, quite a few photos of seemingly nothing or shots that are out of focus or shots where they've taken several of the same ones with slight adjustments to the exposure or the focus, just to try and make sure that at least one of them came out okay. And an insane number of photos of just rocks. Because the geology of the moon was of particular interest to scientists. And so astronauts training, particularly in the later missions, focused very heavily on being able to recognize key characteristics of rocks, in order to allow them to best decide what samples to collect, and to ensure that they got detailed photos of the rock's locations and its surroundings, so that geologists could try and learn as much as possible about the moon without actually being able to go there themselves. In fact, in later missions, they also took a 500mm telephoto lens with them, so that they could get detailed views of rock formations and the mountains, that were much further away or inaccessible to astronauts, such as down in valleys. But just how were they able to take these photos and how difficult really was it? For on the surface, they used what they called data cameras, which were heavily modified versions of the 500Cs. And these were created by Hasselblad specifically for use on the moon. They made many modifications, such as they removed the viewfinder mechanism, they changed the lubricants and the internal material so that the camera could operate in a vacuum, they changed the outer skin to silver rather than black so that it would reflect sunlight, not absorb it, and they also made changes to make it easier to operate whilst wearing a spacesuit. The typical 500C had a small circular shutter button on the front of it, which you press to take a photo. Obviously, quite difficult in big gloves. So the Apollo cameras were modified to have a large square button, which was much easier to press. They also developed a handle, which would attach underneath the camera with a trigger on it that would then press the shutter button. 
so astronauts could actually take a photo just by squeezing the handle grip. Now, in terms of the settings for exposing and focusing, this was made as minimalistic as possible. The lighting was actually pretty predictable, given that they were all landing in daylight and there was no atmosphere or weather to cause any changes to the light levels whilst on the surface. The only variations would be the direction that they were shooting in relation to the sun. With the sun behind them, everything that they were viewing was in full sunlight, so would appear very bright. If they were facing towards the sun, then they would only be seeing the backsides of objects that would then be in shadow. So for exposure, the only changes that the astronauts really needed to make was opening or closing the aperture with the simple instruction that if they were shooting with the sun directly behind them, they would shoot at an aperture of f11. If they were shooting close subjects with the sun behind them, then f8. And then for everything else, the aperture was f5.6 to get as much light from the shaded areas as possible. Now, on a typical camera, you might think that that would be quite difficult to change. On the Hasselblad cameras though, the aperture was controlled by a dial on the lens itself, which with gloves on might be difficult to grip, but they were using lenses that were custom built for use on the moon and were fitted with large thumb plates to allow easy adjustments just by pushing them with one finger. And the lens had these plates fitted to both the aperture and the focus ring, and with the plates placed in known positions on the rings. So it would simply be a case of move the plate to a predetermined position to have a particular setting or focus distance in place. But what about aiming the camera? Just how difficult is that? Well, on the surface, they weren't hand holding the cameras. The cameras were slid onto a mounting plate on the astronaut's chest. So essentially all the astronaut had to do was aim their chest perpendicular to wherever they wanted to photograph. Something that they actually spent many weeks getting used to doing during training, where they would regularly have the cameras mounted to the chest and be practicing taking lots of photos whilst they were also rehearsing other aspects of the EVAs like setting up equipment or collecting rock samples. And another aspect which people might overlook is how much room for error they had whilst aiming. The lens that they used was a 60mm f5.6 lens, which to most people might sound like quite a tight angled lens, but on a medium format camera, it's actually quite a wide field of view. It's roughly equal to a 35mm lens on a full frame camera, which incidentally is exactly what I'm using to film this video and the camera is less than six feet away from me here, and you can see how much room I have around me. If you want to get a rough idea for yourself, it seems most smartphones these days give their main one times camera an equivalent focal length of about 24 to 26 millimeters. So if you zoom your phone into about 1.4 or 1.5 times zoom, that it should be roughly the view that the Apollo cameras were getting. So you could try it for yourself just by holding your phone up near your chest and trying to take a photo of somebody. But that's going to wrap it up for this video. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.